Hey guys, Stockaholics. Thank you for being here today. The Super Cycle. If you guys find this information today useful, greatly appreciate a like. If you have not already, please consider subscribing. So, what will the oil tanker super cycle look like? Will be the topic I will be talking about today. Uh, just a reminder, this is an opinion of some guy on the internet. Uh, it is speculation and that you should also do your own research. Now, if you have some useful information that you would like to share, I would greatly appreciate that in the comments below. Before I go much further, briefly talk about what the heck a supercycle is, if you have not heard about that already. A supercycle, we would consider to be a extended period of time where uh, oil tankers or any other shipping, com uh, shipping segment is earning uh, significantly high rates for a period of several years. So why I've decided to make this video today, if you're like me, you may have heard this super cycle concept a few times before, um, and you may have heard of it from some very intelligent uh, people who will say something like the super cycle is coming, but you may have noticed some things that are, or at least observed some things that you might consider to be missing <laughs> in their theories. So. For me, what the super cycle sounds like when I've heard other people talk about it kind of reminds me of the underpants, gnome, underpants gnomes from South Park. So if you don't know, the underpants gnomes were these fictional characters. They collected certain people's said undergarments in the middle of the night. They did so because they believed at some point they would be able to make a profit by doing so. Now, when confronted to try and explain their uh, business model, <laughs> there was obviously a huge gap uh, for phase two. So kind of, I guess that was the, be the purpose of this video today was be to hopefully fill in that phase two for you guys and try and close in some of those gaps. Now, what I'll be talking about today, the demand side of the equation, which is kind of the, uh, I guess the phase two that I think is missing during a lot of people's super cycle theories in the shipping segment, particularly tankers. And the way I'll be explaining that is world GDP growth in Africa and Asia, and also what I believe to be Western stagnation and decline. Uh, now there's the other side of that, which is more common, the supply side. I'll briefly talk about the fleet age, the investment in new vessels, and I'll close this video talking about these stages of a shipping cycle. Before we go deep into what I think the next super cycle may look like, I thought it might be relevant to talk about the last super cycle. So we saw growth, particularly from China in 2003 to about 2008. And this stimulated uh, a significant growth in tanker demand. So we saw a period where the vessel supply reached a low, uh, and simultaneously, we saw a pickup in the demand of oil, particularly as China uh, had an explosive growth phase in those early 2000s. So we saw during this time, we saw a large uptick in rates for about a few years. Now you, you may notice that in 2008 was the global financial crisis, which uh, also happened to time perfectly with a massive, <laughs> massive, massive order book of tankers. So. As you might expect, ship owners bought way too many sheep, ships, and as a result, for the past 12 years, relative to this uh, super cycle, this boom, they have not been so good. So the question becomes, how will we have another super cycle if there are no other Chinas? So in the year 2020, uh, especially if you follow electric vehicle manufacturers, you may have heard of a concept called peak oil. Um, some people have speculated that it may be here already. Some people may speculate that it may be here as soon as 10 years from now. For me, myself, personally, I'm an extreme oil bull, and I believe, no, the facts do not make sense to align to this philosophy. I believe we are nowhere near peak oil demand. So 
Let me kind of explain that. If you listen to analysts in Western countries, Western countries in particular, even tanker companies executives themselves, who most of the public publicly traded uh, tanker companies are in Western countries, many are infected with a mindset that we are in an oil decline. They're influenced by their local zeitgeist and not by world reality. If you listen to them, I don't blame them for the things that they say. Uh, you, we face certain things, especially uh, recently in terms of things called like cancel culture. Uh, you may even see uh, penalties from governments in these Western countries in the form of carbon credits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you're involved in the oil industry, right? So for these uh, oil executives and also these oil tanker executives to kind of play play ball and to remain in business in these Western countries, they have to kind of uh, subscribe to that uh, that zero uh, zero emissions kind of mindset. Yeah. So they're influenced by a necessity to virtue signal to remain in business. Saying the wrong thing could be detrimental to their very livelihood. Okay, and uh, on top of that, I want to look very briefly at this chart here. You notice something? This is talking about the world oil demand. You notice that we've been on an uptrend significantly until pr about 2020. Now, a lot of people, if you think about this, 2020 has been kind of a disaster in terms terms of the global economy. And we've only seen a decline as small as uh, 9 million barrels a day for the entire year. And you think about that, it, there was about a month during the entire year where the global economy was completely shut down. Um, we've seen tremendous damage to, to local businesses. Uh, and you've seen, and the, all we've seen as a result is a reduction in 9 billion barrels a day. Now, th this site is pro uh, projecting 97 million barrels um, per day for the entire year of 2021. Uh, I don't share that. I think it's going to be higher than that. Uh, the reason for that is because we are already, as of no the uh, middle of November, uh, the end of November 2020, at 95 million barrels per day. And I only expect that to increase in the coming years, especially as we see the vaccines and uh, COVID hysteria coming to a close. And this is why we are nowhere near peak oil demand. So over here are the uh, country's GDP growth in the year 2018. Now, these might not be perfect compared to GDP growth in 2020, but it's to kind of illustrate a, a trend. Now you'll see over here, these blue and dark green uh, color countries are the countries where you see the sig most significant uh, GDP growth. Now the light green, uh, orange, and red are countries with very little, no growth, or negative growth uh, by GDP. Yeah? Now if you look at this map, you'll notice that most of the growth uh, in terms of GDP isn't coming from the United States and Canada. Uh, it's not even coming from South America. It's not coming from Europe, or at least Western Europe. And it's not coming from Australia. In fact, the Western world, based on this chart, is in stagnation. Now, I think that the, these real GDPs don't reflect uh, a, <laughs> the amount of debt that these ha companies have to uh, stimulate this kind of growth. So I actually think that these, this is worse in reality than uh, what we're seeing. Now, if you see on the flip side, where are we seeing countries with a lot of growth? We're seeing that in Africa. Ooh, but that's the first time you've heard that. And Asia, okay? What does this mean? That means that uh, oil demand, particularly in Africa and Asia, is going to go up. Now, I, I made a video about this uh, recently too uh, in, called, Is Oil Dead? And I would recommend checking that out if you'd like more detail on this. But in general, these countries in Africa and these countries over here, they cannot electrify without having first gone through uh, an oil-based growth. Uh, they can't build roads without oil. They can't build an electric infrastructure without 
oil. They cannot do this with solar panels and they cannot do this with windmills. They will be growing because of oil. And th these are where you're seeing growth in the world. And it's not in the United States, <laughs> it's not in Europe, and it's not in uh, anywhere in the Western world. Okay, So how these Western analysts, how these Western countries, how the Western zeitgeist feels about oil doesn't lift these people out of poverty. It doesn't increase their living standards. What does do that? Oil. Now on top of that oil dependent growth that will uh, be coming in uh, Africa and Asia, it does help us to think about where world oil reserves are in relation to said growth, especially when we're thinking about it in terms of tankers because these are the vessels in which we'll be delivering that to these places, right? The majority of this oil is in the Middle East, okay? I'll go back to that graph and to show you this or the map in a second. Um, some of this is in Africa already, uh, but I would argue this isn't sufficient to meet uh, Africa's uh, growing demand. Uh, and I would also argue that North America, because of the zeitgeist that is constricting uh, the oil industry in the United States and Canada in particular, uh, this 16% will not be able to be utilized to meet its own needs. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So let's go back to this uh, and look, about the, uh, look at this in a second. So if we know that almost 60% of oil is going to have to come from the Middle East to supply the uh, future world, that means that, well, tankers are going to have to come from here in particular to uh, deliver oil to Africa and also to Asia. Now on top of it, it's important to think about these Western countries as well. So they may believe, they may have this zeitgeist, they may have this virtue where they believe it is necessary for them to electrify. Well, I would also argue that uh, it's going to be impossible for them to do that. And if you and the reason you can uh, think about this is because of their economies themselves. So the U.S. and Canada, they both have a debt to GDP ratio of 128 percent. These people, these nations are underwater. If you look at the countries in the European Union, they have a debt ranging from 100% to 200% of their GDP. If you look at the debt in Australia, same thing, right? So to meet these nations' green goals, these virtues that they've already signed in the Paris Accords, uh, they need wealth that they don't have. Okay, uh, here's kind of a, a, a kind of a picture to illustrate how poor these nations really are. A homeless man with no debt is $24 trillion richer than Uncle Sam, the US government. This debt means reduced standards of living in the long run for these countries' citizens, right? Now, when we're thinking about that, what does this mean? This means that for these countries to pay back this debt, and believe me, it's going to have to be paid back, they are going to have to increase taxes. What does that mean? That means that there's going to be less growth. So. What does that mean for the poor and middle class? Well, these people, they still need vehicles, right? What does that mean in terms of new vehicles? If they were uh, interested in or they wanted to, to buy a new electric vehicle, well, it is very likely that these poor and uh, middle class people will not be able to do that. An old car, an, a car that runs on gasoline is affordable. A new Tesla, a new Prius, whatever, um, if you're going to have to work two years to pay off that vehicle, it's not worthwhile for you to do so, to buy this vehicle. Now, in addition, there's one more thing I wanted to say about this too. With these green ESG initiatives that we're seeing in North America, this is also likely to mean that the net imports for oil is going to increase for the United States in particular to meet their energy demands. Now they can build as many windmills and solar panels as they want. They're still going to need oil, okay? Uh, and they're not 
we're seeing that um, the fracking industry is in decline because not not so much because of uh, government restrictions, but more because the industry itself is not profitable. <laughs> they can't, especially when you're in 40 and 50 dollar oil. Just to break even, the fracking industry needs uh, roughly 60 dollar a barrel oil. So we've seen enormous capital uh, pumped into fracking in particular in the last decade. Uh, you hear, may hear quotes like, drill a baby drill. That's, I'm here to also tell you that, that that's over. Uh, the capital has dried up. The fracking industry is dead. So what that also means for United States is it means it's no longer going to be a net exporter of oil. It's not going to be sending oil to Mexico and Canada although there is kind of a uh, reciprocal trade between uh, Canada and the United States in terms of oil. It also means it's not going to be shipping it to South America. Um, and what does that mean for these, these nations that need this beautiful black substance? Where is that oil coming from? The ton miles to deliver this oil is going to increase massively. Now this is the other side of the equation, the supply of the tankers, the boats themselves. We are at a point, we are at a cusp, where we have some of the smallest orders we have seen in tankers for <laughs> at least a decade, <laughs> probably closer to two, right, around 2008 or so was when we saw probably the peak order book. Now we are at uh, in terms of the last 15 years, all-time lows. Now, on the flip side of that, we are seeing that these vessels are some of the oldest vessels that we've ever seen. <laughs> the age of these, uh, these, the average age of a, a tanker is almost 10 years old on the fleet. In addition to that, we are seeing increased regulation. Remember that Western zeitgeist? They don't like these old vessels, they do not want to chance a, a oil spill. So on top of that, they're increasing worldwide these regulations uh, on how uh, how you can how old a vessel can be. Now the way that they are restricting these are through these things called surveys. Uh, the older a vessel gets over here, the more expensive it becomes to operate that vessel. So what that does is that encourages you as a tanker owner to get rid of that ship. It encourages you to scrap it the older that it gets. Now, recently, uh, we have seen some extensions on these kinds of um, uh, uh, surveys, particularly because of COVID. So they, uh, because of the pandemic, because uh, we didn't want to spread the virus anymore, uh, scrapping itself has been restricted in 2020. Now, next year, I expect to see a tremendous amount of scrapping. Now, first of all, because rates are uh, terrible and they're going to continue, and I believe they're going to continue to be terrible, particularly because of the supply glut that we saw in uh, March and April of this year. That has to be worked off, uh, particularly when we're talking about the crude side of the market. Now, also, um, those surveys, are they're coming due, right? There's those extensions that we saw because of the COVID, those are going to go away. So I would expect to see a tremendous amount of scrapping in 2021, yeah? Now I would like to say that there are also some hiccups uh, in this thesis. I recently talked about uh, ESG loans. I would recommend checking out my last video if you'd like to know more about that. I think this can be a headwind. Uh, it could be a uh, something like the Cobra effect that may could potentially lead to uh, more vessels uh, which we don't want to see uh, on the supply side, right? Now, also we've seen some uh, a large amount of uh, ordering from China itself. China wants to maintain its uh, oil supplies. They uh, see it as kind of as a national security risk that um, they cannot maintain uh, supply of oil to their nation, particularly when we see uh, we saw the um, the trade war between uh, Trump and uh, China. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, they don't want to be in a position where they have to uh, 
they have to bow to the Western world, right? So they're going to secure their uh, energy lines. But what that does mean is that there is going to be more VLCCs. And as a t uh, tanker owner, we don't really want to see that. Okay, I also wanted to show you guys a video on a man named Mr. Robert Bugby, who is the CEO of a product shipping company named Scorpio Tankers, in which he talks about um, kind of the the supply and the demand and sentiment in the industry all kind of round up uh, wound up into a, a two minute segment by the way i found this from a youtube channel who uh recently who who, who talks about tankers on a uh, regular basis who i'd recommend you guys to check out named um, marius skunechny but he said his name right <laughs> so anyway here's the uh scorpio video why doesn't the market care that things are so fantastic? Does anybody, maybe I'm the person to be answering that question, but does anybody have a, have an, a reason why uh, you're trading at discounts to NAVs and, and people just don't seem to recognize the fantastic opportunity that is? First of all, it's normal. Every time in the last, the last two major <clears throat> bull cycles have been 2003, started then and ended around 2008 and 1980 middle of 1984 ending in 1990 and both of those periods the stock started off in the same position that they were trading significantly under an ev like most of the trades most of the product tanker companies are trading about 50 percent below an ev at the moment and this happened in both of those two cycles and this is a result of, you know, whether it's Peter cried wolf or people just give up or they never think it's going to come or they're too hurt. But whatever it is, the, none of the companies on this panel or the market itself have done anything other than disappoint for about 11 years now. And that's what the market's been in. The market's been in a bear market for 10, 11 years. So what creates the conditions for a super bull market is what we have at the moment, which is tremendous pessimism from the investment community, exhaustion from the investment community, combined with lack of real free cash in the, in the uh, companies. The debt side also is constrained. The shipbuilding is constrained. So you, you've actually got a 20-year low in shipbuilding orders. So everything is at its bottom position. So this is, this is quite normal, and I think this is also part of the aspect of what gives the people, I think, on this panel that confidence is because we're looking forward to not just a period of great demand growth, but the supply side is, is very constrained at the moment in the product side. Okay. Uh, I wanted to also talk about kind of some of the trends that you can see in a shipping cycle. Uh, this was written by uh, Andy Pierce, I believe, at Tradewinds. Uh, so look him up if you'd like. <laughs> He's obviously an expert on the topic. So we in the shipping industry and oil tankers as well, we go through these four kind of stages. Now, I talked about this in some of my other videos. If you'd like to know more about those stages, you can watch some of those too. Now, um, the trough, okay? What some of the signs that you can identify that we are in that stage in a shipping cycle? We're gonna see surplus capacity of vessels. You're gonna see freight rates kind of suck. They're below the op uh, operational expenditures of that company. You're gonna see tight credit. So particularly banks, etc. investors are not gonna want to be involved in this. They're gonna have negative. You're gonna see stock prices decrease. On top of that, we want to see increased demolition. Okay. Now I put this time frame up here. I believe that we could be in a trough from 2020, the second half, all the way until 2022. Now it may be sooner, it may be later. I don't know. This is, I'm just some guy on the internet. Okay. <laughs> now the recovery phase. Some I believe this could last uh, from somewhere between 2022 to 2024. 
In particular, I know that there are significant headwinds in because of the last oil super cycle, where we saw from 2003 to 2008 a significant amount of vehicles uh, being uh, made, right? During these time frames, about 20 years, remember, because of those IMO regulations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these vessels become unprofitable to operate. These vessels will have to be scrapped, okay? So also, supply during this recovery phase, supply and demand, they start to balance out. Uh, sentiment in the industry starts to swing between optimism and doubt. You might say like, well, okay, well you have good rates, but I don't know, how long can this last? You know, you may see increased liquidity. This is going to raise the net asset value of these companies, okay? And you're gonna see prosperous rates. I believe this could last from 2022, maybe 2024. Now the peak will be sometime between 2025 and 2030. And this is when rates are somewhere between two to 10 times the operational expenditures. Uh, by the way, this, this timeline all depends on how these tanker companies decide to build. And it, uh, we'll see about uh, in a second. They, they, they always ruin it. <laughs> You're going to see high bank lending during the peak. You, these banks say, "Wow, this is a good industry. Look at how much money they're making. We gotta, uh, we gotta give these guys money to make new ships." International press coverage. You're going to see stock market listings. The last uh, bull cycle, you may notice that when these companies went public, their graphs of these companies went straight down. So if you start to see some stock market listings for brand new tanker companies, that will be a sign for you to get the hell out. Of Dodge <laughs> if you see high new building activity uh, we haven't seen that yet there is some new building to be alarmed about but um, not a significant in terms of the overall fleet yeah and if you start to hear about a new paradigm shift where shipping is the new Tesla uh, you need to get the hell out <laughs> the collapse uh, will come sometime between 2025 and 2030 and that will be when supply exceeds demand these because of all of that capital because of that exuberance because of all the new buildings there'll be way too many ships freight rates will go to i don't know the bottom of the ocean no money will be made and it would be uh it'll be horrible there'll be economic shock and slowing trade you're gonna see uh new building orders start to decline and you're gonna see the, the interest in those vessels, as far as trading older vessels, decrease. And there'll be confused sentiment. People will not understand what happened. Now, this is the question I often ask myself, and that is, <laughs> am, am I too early or are we, uh, as oil tanker investors, are we too early? Now, um, for me, I don't know how to time a bottom. I've, I think I've said this in some of my other videos. I do have a strategy for playing uh, oil tankers. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can check out um, the cyclical uh, stocks video that I've made and why I love them. Um, but for myself, um, I don't know how to time a bottom. And all I know is that I can value something and how I valued the tankers themselves is a uh, abysmally cheap they're uh, way below what I think that they're worth even in current market conditions right on top of that I would also argue that the market itself is forward-thinking we live in the year 2020 and soon to be the year 2021 and um, we live in the information age uh, there's gonna be a time when people realize uh, oh you know there is a significant imbalance in these stocks, and they will be able to accurately identify the uh, the trends that we have noticed following the industry already. Yeah, so for me, um, maybe I'm too early. Maybe the stocks will go down more, um, but I'm happy to be in them um, now, and I'm happy to hold the companies with the I believe strongest balance sheets uh, that will likely survive this trough. Yeah, and I'm ready for when the market realizes what I do. <laughs> so uh, again, if you found this information useful, greatly appreciate a like. And if you are not already, please consider subscribing.